Amen. Well, it's good to be back in Medford. It's been a blessing. I have very fond memories of Medford. In fact, it was, it was a miracle of sorts that we even came here. Uh, we lived in Portland in 91, and, and uh, somehow there was kind of a, a feeling inside me that God wanted me to do something. Rosemary and I both felt the same way. It's like we, we feel like there's some calling somewhere. And we were at a postal convention. I'm not sure my wife was there. I was there. And um, it was about 10.30 at night, and I got a phone call from the pastor from Medford. And uh, he said, Brother Mark, have you ever thought about coming to Medford? And I says, well, no. <laughs> but he said he'd really like me to pray about it and, and let him know because he'd really like me to come and, and join in the work here in Medford. He said he'd already talked with Brother Carver. So um, I was about 15 feet from the district overseer, uh, a postal overseer. And as soon as I hung up from him, I walked over 15 feet and I talked, talked to him about coming to Medford. Well, he, uh, she knew a little about me and uh, she was very interested right off the bat, which was a little surprising. And before that evening was over, I was in the works to come to Medford. Now, I'll let you know this started at 10.30 at night. They ended up creating a job that didn't exist here so I could come and paid for all the cost expense of moving here. And uh, I tried to go cheap because I, I, I stayed at the Tiki Lodge, I think, that's, I think that's the name of it over here, that the kind of kind of smells like they've been cooking uh, Asian food at night or something. Uh, I wish like everything I'd gotten a little better unit. I stayed there for two months. But anyway, uh, God bless. And then it was uh, 95. Got a phone call April 1st. Didn't really pay much attention to that date at that point. And Brother Dwight says, Brother Mark, how would you like to be a, a pastor? And we, I need to know by tomorrow. And so I hung up. Of course, I have, I've had that little bit, that same feeling. God has some plan for us. So I sat down with the, the girls. Sean was in school in Portland. And we told them that we'd been asked to be pastors. And they, I remember Heidi looked at me and looked at the girls. She says, April Fools! That's the first time it occurred to me. This was April 1st. But it wasn't an April Fool joke. It was for real. And uh, again, God worked it out. In a couple of months, we moved to Eureka, California, and that's how the pastorate started. For about 21 years, I was pastor. Ended up in, uh, in St. Louis, and then uh, we decided to talk to Brother Bob. If they had someone there, we had someone in mind. We didn't tell him, but he had the same person in mind. But uh, became the pastor there in St. Louis. We moved to Sacramento. And uh, I think we've been busier, or as busy now than we were before we retired. But anyway, it's, it's been a blessing being in the gospel. And God's the same. And we're thrilled to be here today. I'd like to read in 1 Kings, the third chapter, fifth verse, and then I'll bounce down to the eighth verse here. I'd like to talk about choices. You know, I've just been talking to you about some choices that were made in my life, in our life as a family. We left our girls here. Uh, we were thankful that uh, Brother Earl Phillips kind of took them under his wing when we left, and uh, that was a blessing too. The kids said, uh, they thought that the kids were supposed to run away from home, not the parents, but God took care of that. Third verse. In Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night. God said, ask what I shall give thee. And at that point in time, Solomon was very, you might say, we call it anxiety today. Uh, he was all of a sudden the king of a great nation. And he commenced to tell the Lord for several verses here how unworthy he was. And he, he didn't even know how to go out and come in. But God had asked him, anything 
So let's go down to 8th verse. And thy servant is in the midst of thy people which thou hast chosen, a great people that cannot be numbered nor counted for multitude. Give therefore my servant an understanding heart to judge thy people that I may discern between good and bad, and who is able to judge this thy uh, so great a people. And the speech pleased the Lord, and Solomon had asked, that Solomon had asked this thing. And God said unto him, Because thou hast asked this thing, and hast not asked for thyself long life, neither have asked riches for thyself, nor hast asked uh, the life of thine enemies, but hast asked for thyself understanding and discernment, and discern judgment. Behold, I have done according to thy words. Lo, I have given thee a wise and understanding heart, so that there was none like thee before thee, neither after thee shall any arise like unto thee. And I have also given thee that which thou hast not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall not be any among the kings like unto thee all thy days. And if thou wilt walk in my ways, to keep my statutes and my commandments, as thy father David did walk, then I will strengthen thy days. Choices. He made a good choice. And at the end of the last verse I read, there was a condition that goes along with that. God promised him everything. He, he, you might say he had it made, and it, it showed many wise decisions he made after that, and wealth, abundance. He was known and honored. One queen came and said, the half has not been told. But yet, it depended upon keeping God's commandments. Nothing shapes our life more than commitments that we choose in everyday situation. Life is all about choices. In fact, this very day, if you are just stop and start jotting down choices you made, little choices, big choices. It could be there are good versus the bad. And certainly there is a great degree of validity to that thinking. Keep your, uh, in your Bible, look up Luke 10 and put your finger in it and turn to Joshua 24. As the children of Israel prepared to settle into the promised land, Joshua exhorted them. First he he spoke prophetically what God told him to speak. But he ended saying, Choose this day whom ye will serve. And then boldly declares, But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That was a good choice in Joshua 24, 15. Joshua was choosing to make a strong commitment to the Lord. To serve the Lord Jehovah rather than to the false gods that were being worshipped all around them. In fact, as he goes on, he cries out to Israel to make a decision for the Lord. Now the word now in verse 14 is interesting because he changes here from what God had inspired him and told him to tell the children of Israel to he says, now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your fathers had served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt, and serve ye the Lord. This indicates to me that he had finished what God had told him to do. Now he was speaking from his heart. He was going deeper, and now, this is how I feel. I want to, this, this is the last opportunity he ever had to speak this way. Joshua himself was giving an exhortation to the Israelites. He'd been preaching the prophetic message, and now he is speaking from his heart. The final message, the last opportunity to ever be extended to uh, an invitation to speak to this people. He'd been leading them. This is one of the most straightforward invitations ever given, certainly in God's word even. One of the most clear-cut decisions ever presented to a people. Choose you this day whom you're going to serve. Choices. The response called for 
involves two strong confessions from a person. In Joshua 24, 16 through 18, it says, And the people answered and said, God forbid that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For the Lord our God, he it is that brought us up out of our fathers, out of the land of Egypt, from the house of bondage, and which did those great signs in our sight, and preserved us in all the way wherein we went, and among all the people through uh, whom we passed. 18th verse, And the Lord drave out from before us all the people, even the Amorites which dwelt in the land. Therefore will we also serve the Lord, for he is our God. They sure, certainly gave a loyal allegiance to the Lord at that time through the inspiration of a man whose heart was pouring out to them. Choose you this day whom you may serve. Now, we, we could probably say this strong confession was great, and they did. Sometimes we have choices from uh, choices of between good and the best. Ever thought about that? I remember several years ago, uh, even when I lived here, there was a Sears and Roebuck down there, and they had, you go into the, the tire store there, and they have tires good, better, and best. And I never forgot that. If I was, had an old car that I was going to keep maybe a few months and I was going to sell it, and I, I'd probably go for the cheap, just good tires. The difference basically was the amount of rubber on the tire. But if I was going to had a good car and I planned to keep it for the long haul, I'd probably want to go for the best. Well, in the gospel, it's always better to go for the best. Don't go for just good. Go for the very best. This principle is masterfully illustrated in Luke 10. Upon entering the village, Jesus welcomed into the house a woman named Martha. Jesus is welcomed. She has a sister called Mary, who was also present. While she was attempting to do all the right things as a hostess, Martha is at first distracted and quickly becomes distraught. The Bible says cumbered. It means to draw around, to twist, to be drawn here and there, to be distracted. She is distracted by much serving, which was good. She was wanting to please the visitors there, had the very best. She loved others, so she ministered to them, helping whoever she and whatever she could in the neighborhood there using her own home as a center for caring, but Martha had a problem. She was cumbered. Loaded down with cares and needs of others. And maybe what they thought of her when she was doing these things. She became so weighed down and burdened, so tired and fatigued, so and, uh, pressured and tense that she lost all sight of her priority, why she was doing this. She became aggravated and critical of those who were not helping. Her frustration spills out all over Jesus. In verse 40, it says, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her, therefore, that she help me. What's interesting is the answer that Jesus gave here. The 40, 41st and 42nd verse here. Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Mary had chosen the very best. Martha had chose the good. It wasn't sinful, but it was good, but it wasn't the very best. In the Greek, agathos, this phrase refers to the highest quality or very best 
as distinct from the whole. Mary had chosen the best over the good. That's what exactly had Mary had chosen. She sat at Jesus' feet and heard his words. Verse 39, basically Mary had chosen to be rather than to do at that moment. This is something we can learn. We could probably say, well, I, I, would, I would have chosen along with Mary too. Looking back on it, we put the pieces, we know the end of the story, so it's easy for us to, to think the right choices. Martha, as good as they were, they were not good enough, were they? Did not meet the one basic essential life need. It's easy for us sometimes to get caught up in the weights and cares of life. Looking back in choices in my life, when I was young, starting to look in the future a little bit, uh, I think I was a teenager, uh, I started dreaming of what I wanted in life. I'd seen enough to see what I, of what I really, my dream was to have kind of a ranch style home out in the country by a lake or a, an ocean or something where and I have a little rowboat and a dock out in front in the backyard and that's how I lived. I could just scoot out there and catch fish and, and, and that was a dream that I had. It never happened because God never sent me there. It was after I got married. I had more than I'd ever had before. Just bought a house a month before. And I remember I had a habit. I'd say a habit. It was not a bad habit. It wasn't the best habit. It, it, was, it wasn't thought from my heart. But I'd get down and pray. And one of my common things, Lord, I'll go where you want me to go. I'll do what you want me to do. I'll be what you want me to be. And I'd be it over and over again. One time, shortly after I was married, I was walking up the steps of our new home with a few lawn chairs and a grandfather clock that wasn't finished and a, uh, a few things like that in the house, but more than I ever had. And I was thinking of that. God, I'll do where you want me to go. And I, as I got to the front door, it's like God spoke to me. Do you really mean what you're saying? Whoa, I couldn't even say it. I'm, I just clammed up my mouth. Is he going to ask me to walk off these steps and never come back? Is he going to tell me to give this up? I, I it took me a little bit, not very long, but enough to make me think, I'm just not going to say this just loosely. And at that point in time, he says, Lord, if this is your will, I'll hold everything I have from this point on with a loose hand. So you see when Brother Dwight called me on April 1st, I'd already held it. I'd already made that decision. That was years later, but I'd held things with a loose hand, and we were ready to go. In a moment's notice, whatever it was, I never, well, the first pastor, I will say, uh, was at the coast. So God gave me a little bit of that because I could open the upstairs window, and Randy could probably remember that place, and you could hear the buoys out there. We used to go out on the beach and walk on the beach, so he did let me have a little of my dream for about four and a half years. But God is blessed. But the choices that made didn't just start with me. They also started with my mother. When I was very young, she put a high priority on having family devotions. That was very important. But she also taught us that we need to have our own private devotions too. Family devotions doesn't fill the need for private devotions. And, you know, maybe you haven't thought about this, but we'd go camping in tents, and probably around two-week blocks about every year. Our whole family would go out in, a, in Idaho, and we'd go in the wilderness there, and those lakes, and we'd fish and have a fire there, and we'd have a wonderful time. But it didn't stop us from having devotions every morning. At night, we'd have short devotions. But also, after the morning devotion, before lunch, Mother would tell my sister and I, I'm go I have a place where I have my, my little altar. I want you to go out and find your place. I have a picture today, still have, of a, I got in my little rowboat and I rowed across the river, had to a machete and an ax, and I cleared out a little path through the thick foliage, chopped down a tree and made 
an altar. I used a rope to tie the other end and put it between two, wedged it between two trees going up on one side and the other side I, I braced it with two uh, logs coming up and wrapped it in rope. I don't know, it, it's probably the, the, the remnant is still there, not a long time ago. Uh, but for several years I'd go back to that same spot. Sometimes I'd swim, sometimes I'd row my boat over and I'd pray. God would meet me there. It was a special time. It built that decision that I was taught to do and following through and making that decision wasn't a hardship for me. It was wonderful. I, could, I, I thought I could just sing to my, as loud as I wanted to. But it even helped me to learn a little bit about why God pushed, Jesus would push it out in the waterways to preach to the thousands. <clears throat> because I wasn't very far from the water. I was about a mile away from everybody else. No one can hear me except the water carried my voice and everybody could hear me. That was a little embarrassing, but you know, God was good. Now Martha, as good as they were, they were not enough, did not meet the basic essential need. She needed to give her very best. Spiritual hunger is what she needed. Let us think back. In that kind of situation, we can also get involved with the weights and cares of life, uh, religious and non-religious, and leave out what is the very best. Times in the secret place with our Father is often stolen by things that must be done. Unnecessary meetings, errands to run, work to do, too much, spite, much time spent on online, chat, whatever it may be, rather than coming to the house of God on Sunday, Wednesday. You know, it's easy for us to fall in the pattern. For a year, just about a year, we'd sit in sometimes our robe in the morning with a cup of coffee and listen to the service online. And to have church, have to drive 40 minutes to church on Sunday morning, Oh my, I'm enjoying what I'm doing. But there's a reason why we should gather together. There's a reason why we should be together. That's the very best. It was good that we have the privilege. You know, I think 30 years ago, there wasn't Zoom. There wasn't this way. I don't know what we would have done then. And we would probably work something out, but we, we had it really established well. I enjoyed the Sunday school classes, even the beginner's department. They were coming out of Portland every Sunday. We'd listen to the service in the afternoon and the evening. God blessed us, but he wants us to gather together. That's the very best. That's what he says. We need to be a witness for the Lord in everything we do. So I, I may not in one sense ever gotten what my dream was when I was a teenager, but that dream changed because we, we talk in the morning. We sit out in our backyard, and, uh, beautiful backyard, and we said, we've got it so good. We have it so nice. We're blessed. God has blessed us and taken care of us. He'll take care of all of us. But the choices, sometimes small choices, God is there to help us make the right ones sometimes when we don't even know coming on Highway 90 in Washington, coming back to Tacoma several years ago. We were talking, and I went right past the off-ramp. I was kind of in a hurry. I missed the off-ramp, and it took me about five miles to get in the, come back. That five miles kept us from getting in a head-on collision. And as soon as we came around that corner and got on the road, we should have gone on the beginning. It was a semi, a head-on collision with a car. It was only very small, instant death. It just had happened just minutes before, five minutes before. The ambulance and the police weren't even there yet. You know, sometimes we'll make a turn when we trust in the Lord that he'll help us make choices. We don't know what we would have done. The little choice of turning left instead of right. When we're in the hand of God, he's always there. Our devotion to God is a daily affair. Everything we do. 
His word is to be a daily experience, just like my mother taught me from a small child. And we never forgot it. We still are enjoying the time together, my wife and I, when we sit down and have devotion times. We call it daily devotions, and I think when we had it with our kids, sometimes we call it family time because it, it ended up with supporting one another. We'd have a plan, and sometimes they were kind of loose. Our goal was to see our kids make heaven, and all of a sudden one would open up at a problem they're having at school, and everything about our plan would go out the window because we'd shift on that concern. We'd get down and pray for one another. More than once we'd end up in tears at our family time, devotion time. That's what God wants us to have. Martha was making a greater provision for her guest than was needed. She probably had several different sequences of things she was bringing. She wanted everything just perfect, wanted everything just right in the right place, but she was missing out on why Jesus came to the house in the first place, and that is to prepare them for what was coming, his death on the cross, and for them to be a witness for them throughout the life. I'm reminded of a famous evangelist who, leaving his home one weekend for a campaign, said goodbye to his son, and his son came out and says, Dad, when are you going to stay home and visit us? Ouch. You see, he was an evangelist that went all over the place but his primary goal was his children. God had given this missionary outreach to his children to make them. And to them, they were looking at the case where it seemed like God was taking their father away from them. We've got to be careful what we do and put God first in everything. Life is really about choices. We will make choices every day. Maybe many good ones, maybe bad ones, possibly ugly ones, or the best ones, even before this day is over. Even going home today, just stop and think. Every time you, you think, decisions, choices, do we stop at the store and get some food? Do we do this or that? Those are choices. Keep in mind that we want God first in our choice. There's nothing wrong with those things. There's nothing wrong with wanting a nice house by a lake. But God may have something better planned. The good news is that God's Word shows us how to make the very best choices, and we can begin today. Choose widely. Let's make a decision for the Lord in everything we do. The consequences of decisions we make every day is going to determine down the road your family, your future, your posterity, everything you do. But we can choose the very best. Let's choose for the long haul. And God will bless us. God bless you. We're praying for you, and we, uh, you know, just about every day when we're praying, going through our, our children up and down the West Coast, we remember uh, not only John and Heidi and Ethan and Isaac and Evan, but also uh, the Medford Church. It's on our hearts, too, and we'll continue praying. God bless you. Let's turn to 210.